What is the scariest thing you've ever witnessed? When I was six or seven, my mother tried to suffocate my sister with a pillow because she didn't listen to her. The pillow thing was normal, it happened very often, but this time mom was so angry that she was ordering me to bring a knife. She said, go to the kitchen and bring a knife. I'm going to kill your sister. After that, she got annoyed at me and tried to kick me out of the house, but then my father came back from work and stopped her. Watching the final race of the 2011 IndyCar season, this race took place at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, which is one and a half miles and not designed for the much slower NASCAR. Many drivers had voiced their concerns about the track prior to the race, but those concerns fell on deaf ears. On lap 11, going around 225 miles per hour, there was a 16-car crash going into the first turn. Multiple cars flew through the air, including the defending Indy 500 champion, Dan Weldon. Weldon flew into the catch fence, causing major head injuries. Weldon died on his way to the hospital. I was only seven when I saw this, and I didn't watch another IndyCar race until 2017 because I was so scared of seeing another person die. When I was a kid, before my parents divorced, they would have the nastiest fights. When my dad got really angry, his eyes would go blank and he would do truly horrific things. A few times, he pressed my mom against the wall with a butcher's knife to her stomach slash throat, and I, two to six years old, would watch as my mom pleaded with him, tears streaming down her face to not kill her. When the coast was clear, my mom would take us to the car and go exploring the outdoors with us for the day. Those trips were some of the happiest times I can remember, but then we'd always have to come back home. Mom didn't dare leave in case he'd go after our relatives or burn the house down with our cats inside. We escaped eventually, years later, mind you, but I still have nightmares about that man every night. The house I grew up in had this vacated lot right next to it. One night, me and my sister were watching TV in the living room, and we kept hearing someone call out my sister's name. I go outside to check it out, and this creepy-ass dude was jerking off in the lot and continued to call my sister's name. We went to tell my dad, and my dad blew up. He grabbed a screwdriver went to the lot and grabbed a slime ball by his shirt and slammed him against the car. I seriously thought I was going to see my dad kill someone in front of my own eyes. Then my neighbor, who was a very good family friend, somehow managed to calm my dad down and talk some sense into him. The creeper booked it. It was terrifying. I was 12 and everyone was freaking the fuck out. I was really grateful for my neighbor that night. My dad overdosed on Oxycontin when I was 12. My mom was abusive, so I made attempts to get incarcerated to get away from my home life. During that time, my aunt had just moved back home, and I asked her to petition for custody. We spent the next few years in and out of courts. Little did I know, my uncle was the dope cook, so my life quickly changed from troubled child to drug manufacturing. I spent a lot of my time watching surveillance cameras, basically being an armed guard for the house. One night, I was sitting on the couch drawing, pistol between my legs and Great Dane at my feet as my aunt and uncle were finishing a batch of dope. They were laughing and giggling, probably fucking around a bit. Shortly after I heard a scream, I grabbed my little pistol, Taurus 25 caliber, and ran to the back room. When I threw the door open, smoke billowed out of the room. My uncle blew past me, about knocking me over. My aunt stood topless, trembling in shock as my uncle ran around the house with melted flesh dripping off his arms. The lab had exploded. After realizing what had happened, I grabbed the keys to the gar, wrapped my aunt in a blanket, and shoved the two of them out the front door, then throwing the keys at them. After locking the front, I ran through the house, opening up every window. As I went through the house, gathering up the drugs, guns, remaining chemicals, the first responder is pulling up the driveway, throwing all the paraphernalia I had into a dresser drawer. I made it out the back door as he was coming in the front. I loaded the materials into the back of my 91 GMC and drove around the front of the house. He yelled from the front porch that the flames are out and everything is okay. I responded from the driver's seat, my uncle's on the way to the hospital, I got to go, and I spun tires down the driveway. Driving about two to three miles down the road, I dumped the chemicals in a ditch and drove the remaining drugs and guns to my cousin's chicken house and stashed them. Staying with my cousins a few days, my aunt and uncle finally got home from the hospital and everything seemed to be okay. No cops showing up, no fire department investigating, we were in the clear. 
The only reason I remember how old I was was because when I was pulling out of the driveway, I remember not having a license, only my permit. I was 15. During these times, I wasn't a dopehead. I had done dope, but mostly smoked and sold pot. Knowing I had a little brother and lots of friends around me being the weed man, I would give my friends weed, cheap or free, to occupy their attention away from the harder drugs. I was self-aware, and I knew what I was doing. Things continued that way for about a year until a second explosion. This time, I wasn't home and we weren't so lucky. I was attending half-day college courses in the city when the fire happened. After school, I arrived home and every cop, ATF agent, county sheriff, fire department, hazmat teams were at my house. Sneaking through the woods, I walked up and watched for a while. Deciding I couldn't leave my brother, I walked up on the scene. The police drew guns on me, put me on the ground, and began interrogating me saying they know who I was and how I was involved, blah, blah, blah. All I knew is that I couldn't leave my brother. DHS lady showed up to take us to a state group home. I asked the lady if it's possible we'd be separated, and they said yes. I decided that doesn't work for us, and we escaped custody. After sneaking out of the state building, we went on the run for about two months. My brother was nine. I was 16 by now. I knew I couldn't keep it up, and I also knew I couldn't leave him so I turned myself in. We spent the next year in state custody until our grandparents got us out. My aunt and uncle went to prison. I continued drug dealing until it turned to guns, which turned into the feds looking for me by 18. Knowing I had to change my life or give it the prison system, I decided to join the military, serving the next five years from 1923 as a U.S. Navy corpsman. Since then, I have changed my ways and now run a successful jewelry business. My brother is 26, doing great, and making close to six figures selling soles for shoes. A funny thing about all this, I still slang rocks, and my brother sells soles. My drunk skipper, angrily storming up to the foredeck to show me how to do it at 3 a.m. in 40 knots of breeze 1,000 miles from Hawaii with no life jacket or harness. The backstory is, that I found out the skipper of the racing yacht I signed up to crew was a raging alcoholic, but I didn't find out until about day five of a 14-day trans-Pacific race when he started drinking. He was old school, which meant he screamed at everybody, threw things, dumped our trash into the ocean, and because he was the skipper, he didn't need to wear his life jacket or clip in because he'd been racing for 40 years and had a shell full of line honors trophies. To his credit, he didn't go over and made it two whole days in Hawaii before getting arrested, so I didn't have to continue on to Indonesia with him. When you're riding motorcycles at night with friends, unless you're first, then you'll see your friend's red taillights. When you're riding at high speed, and all of a sudden, instead of just taillights, you see headlight, taillight, headlight, taillight, this means someone has at least crashed. What's worse here is that all the other guys start to slow down slash stop and pull over, but there are guys behind you that are still hauling ass. Each and any of them could hit you since you're slowed slash stop or they continue past you at high speed and run into the wreckage from the first guy. It's one of the reasons I stopped riding on the street. I got tired of meeting nice guys and their wives then having to talk to those nice wives in emergency rooms. The issue usually comes down to new slash young guys thinking that the difference between them and the fast guys in a group of riders is just bravery slash balls. It's not in any way. The difference is usually years of track time on a racetrack and the technique slash experience that comes with it. A mediocre club racer can drop into a corner at 100 miles per hour plus and he's no more concerned than if he's making a ham sandwich. His experience is doing all the proper things on the checklist. He's already done his braking, has picked his line, has his weight on the inside peg, is rolling on the throttle at the apex, has his eye on his exit and knows where the other riders are around him. The new guy entering the corner is scared shitless, staring at the tree he doesn't want to hit, wishing he wasn't running the old worn out back tire that's been on his bike for the last six years and wondering why his super spongy brake lever isn't slowing his bike down enough, all while wondering if he's a pussy. I do a lot of sailing now. It's the same excitement of competition and camaraderie, but worst case scenario is someone ends up with a nose full of water if they crash. So my house and the place I work are about a 51 minute drive away. One night, I got off work at about 8.55 p.m. Now there are a few turns to make when getting from work to my house, 
but the last turn takes me to a road that's about 19 miles to my house. Now on this road, there is this big empty field for almost the entirety of the 19 miles. So as I'm driving on this road, I see in my headlights that there is something lying down in the road. I step on the brakes so I can get a better look at what's on the road and avoid hitting it. Now I just want to say that this whole encounter lasted maybe only for a few seconds because I never had a chance to fully stop my car before everything happened. As I'm slowing down my car, the thing that's lying on the road turns its head to look at me. I can see its eyes reflecting off my headlights, sort of like a cat. I have many stray cats in my area, so I know what their eyes look like at night. Now this is the part that sounds like I'm making this up, but I swear that I'm telling the truth. Before I come to a complete stop, the thing lying in the road gets up on its hind legs and runs into the field. I fully stop and I audibly yell out loud, what the fuck? I look out at the field where the thing ran into, but I can't see it. I sit there for a few seconds, contemplating what the hell I just saw, when suddenly I'm hit with this overwhelming feeling that I need to get the fuck out of there. I slam on the gas and book it out of there. I was probably doing 90 when the speed limit is 75, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get out of there. That's it. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what I saw. I don't really believe in ghosts or demons or anything like that. I still think that there has to be some kind of logical explanation for what I saw. I don't know, but what I do know is whatever it was, it sure as hell freaked me out. My son was four, was playing football with me back and forward in the living room, just simple passes across the floor, nothing stupid. He tripped and fell face first onto the corner table. My immediate reaction was, he's blind in that eye. The noise in the whole thing was literally unbearable, and I have one hell of a strong stomach for all things nasty. I picked him up, and he had a massive cut on his eyebrow, just missed his eye by half an inch. Half his face was covered in blood, and it was still pissing out of him. I immediately calmed him down, so he stopped crying and told him daddy will fix it, because daddy fixes everything according to him. So I used my extensive self-knowledge of repairing cuts and fixed him right up, went to urgent care, and they glued him up good. The nurses even complimented me on my work and asked where I trained. I said no training, just fixed a lot of cuts on myself and other people at work over the years. He's got a potter scar now, so I'm told I have no idea what that is. That instant when his face met the table corner still haunts me to this day, and I've had three operations and been awake during one of them. Nothing bothers me at all except this one thing. Makes me feel sick just writing it down. I pulled into my work parking lot, seen a guy walking beside a store. I don't normally wave at strangers, but something told me to wave at this guy. He continues to walk, and I start to walk up the sidewalk to go into work. I look to my left and see him crossing a five-lane road with no pedestrian walkway. A black car comes out of nowhere and hits him. I must have blinked, or my brain blocked out him actually getting hit, because the only thing I remember is the car's brakes being loud and then seeing the man laying in the road. He did not make it. I went into my shift and went home like normal. Still think about it every time I walk into work or drive down that road. 